You're listening to Economics Detective Radio. My guest today is Fabio Rojas. He is professor of sociology at Indiana University Bloomington. Fabio, welcome to Economics Detective Radio. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. So Fabio is the author of two books. The first is From Black Power to Black Studies, How a Radical Social Movement Became an Academic Discipline, which was published in 2007. The second book, uh, co-authored with Michael Heaney, is Party in the Street, the Anti-War Movement, and the Democratic Party after 9-11, which was published more recently in 2015. So we'll get to talking about the subjects of those books in a minute, but first I wanted to get a little meta. Uh, we've, I've done over 60 episodes of this show, and this is the first time I've invited a sociologist to be on the show. So let's talk about the discipline in general, uh, I guess the disciplines, so sociology and economics and what's the relationship between them. So my first question for you, Fabio, is let's say an undergraduate student was deciding what first year courses to enroll in and they asked you, you know, what is sociology? What, what would you tell them about the field? Yeah, I would say, look, you know, sociology is the scientific study of people and their communities. And sociologists study things that a lot of people really care deeply about. Uh, They study inequality. They study things like income inequality, racial inequality, gender inequality. They also study what you might call structural things like politics, how people get elected, what governments do, how they formulate policy. There's also a very deeply psychological aspect to uh, psych, uh, sociology as well. There are a lot of great social psychologists who do research in sociology. So if you're taking an intro course, we talk about things like the presentation of self. When you interact with another person, how do you present yourself and how does that frame the interaction and how does that guide what happens between people? So uh, when I teach my freshmen, I say, you know, this is not like uh, nuclear physics where you might forget the theory as soon as you walk out the door and said, so this is uh, modern society. This this is the study of how people interact, how they get along with each other, who wins and who loses in society. So I think that's something that's very relevant uh, to people's lives. Yeah, it seems like sociology had a sort of interdisciplinary element to it, or, or it, uh, it overlapped with other disciplines from the start. It seems like economics used to be very, very separate from other social sciences, but, uh, you know, over the past half century or so has started to overlap more and more people like uh, Gary Becker starting who started applying economic methods outside of traditionally economic subjects and then a few decades later you have Daniel Kahneman and the behavioral economists uh, you know come along start studying things typ- typically associated with psychology i think if th- this were 100 years ago and you asked pe- social scientists to define their field they'd talk about exclusively about what they study. But now it seems like, at least when we're making distinctions between amongst ourselves and amongst each other, we, we'd focus more on the, the methods rather than the subject matter. So let's, uh, let's move on from, uh, you know, an undergraduate to asking about what sociology is. Like, what, what would you tell an economist or, or a psychologist distinguishes sociology, even when they they may be studying the same topics. Right. So one thing I like to emphasize is that actually a lot of the social sciences have a common starting ground. Um, before we get to the differences, I just want to emphasize that. Um, and the starting ground is this, which is that we're all social scientists. Uh, we all care about data. We all care about theory. We all care about evidence. So, for example, sometimes when you speak to people in other disciplines, um, there will be a rhetoric of, we have the real data, we have the real methods. You don't. We're better <laughs> than you. I think I think that's a little bit misleading. Um, so, for example, like uh, sociologists were uh, crucial in developing surveys, which everybody uses. Uh, you know, just like any other quantitative social science, quantitative sociologists use regression analysis. They also do experiments. They also do natural experiments and data. And they've done it for 40 or 50 years. Um, so in a very profound sense, uh, political science, uh, economics, uh, sociology, uh, people in public policy schools, education, they're all working from the same uh, toolkit on a very fundamental level of data, theory, and analysis. And so that's the 
starting point. So I would say, you know, we're not from Mars. We're not from a different planet. We do actually overlap with uh, other disciplines do a great deal. And once you understand that, then it makes sense to um, think about what's the differences, right? So if we're all talking about data theory methods, often quantitative, sometimes qualitative, then what does sociology bring to the table? That's maybe a little bit different than other fields. One is definitely the topic of study. Um, so, for example, I think it's pretty safe to say that modern economics is really the theory of choice applied to a wide range of situations. So, in other words, you know, uh, let you mentioned Gary Becker earlier. He's the greatest uh, champion of this way of looking at things where he says, look, all social interactions have choice. Once you understand they have choice, you can use the language of neoclassical economics. You can, out, you can talk about utility functions, marginal analysis, equilibrium analysis, and so forth. And you can can un you can model that social interaction, whether it be a traditional commercial setting uh, or it could be people finding a marriage partner. These diverse kinds of interactions can be modeled using this basic theory of choice that's found in neoclassical economics. In contrast, um, sociologists do not uh, reduce social interactions down to just choice. Uh, they really uh, are more deeply concerned with the social psychology of uh, why people are choosing what they do rather than just what the equilibrium is. Um, they are often more more interested in the holistic context or the kind of the big picture uh, look. They're more willing to consider quantitative and qualitative forms of data at the same time. And so that's why I say that sociology and economics overlap, that there's a style of economics called rational choice sociology that overlaps with economics. But then there's other kinds of sociology which uh, do things that most economists are uninterested in doing or not willing to look into and so forth. So I would say that's a really good starting point of thinking about where sociology is different, that we look at social context context, we look at the sources of preferences, we look at groups as resources and as domains of action rather than just looking at a utility function. And that's kind of the starting point of where you'd see the differences. And by the way, I'm one of the one of the believers that economics and sociology have a lot of roots in common. The Many of the early sociologists were trained in economics departments. Uh, Parsons, for example, the mid-20th century sociologist, uh, got his PhD in economics. Max Weber, his PhD, was in political economy. That's what they called it in the late 18th hundreds. And so you see a lot of overlap in not just the ideas, but the people themselves. So sometimes we like to pretend there's a giant uh, wall between sociology and economics. And there are some genuine differences. I'm not going to underplay them. But at the same time, there's also commonalities that can allow for a very uh, constructive dialogue between the areas. Yeah, yeah. I, I like what you say about um, social psychology. The interesting thing is a lot of economic, a lot of economists trace the field, sort of its birth back to Adam Smith. You know, mm -hmm. there, there were people doing economics before him, but he's sort of a focal point for the history of economic thought. And he wrote two books. Uh, you know, one is the, the Wealth of Nations, but uh, the other one is the Theory of Moral Sentiments, which we've sort of been rediscovering recently. But it, it really is a work in social psychology and uh, and sort of showcases how these how these fields overlap. Yeah, that, that's absolutely right. Um, and this is the very interesting thing. This rigid division between economics and other areas of inquiry is really a 20th century thing. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at uh, the 19th century, you see uh, a lot of different types of research and writing being bundled together and being called political economy. Um, and uh, I think Adam Smith is a really great example. He's, er he's obviously 18th century, not 19th century, but he's a great example where you know, a lot of roots of modern neoclassical economics are in Adam Smith, but also theory of moral sentiments is essentially a text in sociology, right? Mm -hmm. And the main question of moral sentiments, uh, or one version of it, there it's a, it's a very kind of complex text when you read it, but, you know, one takeaway from that book is how do people's emotions, beliefs, taste preferences uh, relate to their position in the group, right? And how, what's that interplay look like? So for example, there's a very famous passage in uh, Theory of Moral Sentiments, I believe, where Adam Smith says something like, you know, uh, we feel more pain when we cut our finger than when we hear that a thousand people died in China, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a great example of in-group versus out-group, right? The classic sociological distinction or social psychological distinction, which is that we tend to put a higher utility function, a higher utility value on people in our group versus people who are outside the group. And, you know, I think this really speaks to the breadth of Adam Smith's thinking. 
but also to the wide range of later social research where, okay, you can take um, economics and you can turn it into a bunch of utility maximization problems, but also you could create a social science which seriously considers things, considers things like identity, emotion, group membership, and that draws you towards uh, sociology or social psychology. And that's what you see in the modern social sciences, this great uh, breadth of thinking. One thing we haven't touched on is the sort of relationship between these disciplines and social activism. For instance, I mean, the subtitle of your first book was How a Radical Social Movement Became an Academic Discipline. And it, it seems like economics and sociology, uh, especially viewed from the outside, have these fundamentally different relationships with uh, ideology. Economics is about, uh, I mean, they're both in academia. And so economics is about, you know, say, two thirds uh, left and one third right. But then when you when you do polls of sociologists, you get crazy numbers like 44 to one left to right. And it can look to like in the popular media, like sociology is this left wing discipline and economics is this right wing dis discipline. Uh, you know, do you want to address sort of that perception? Sure, absolutely. So, um, you know, it starts to ask, starts to, it, I'm sorry, it helps to start, ugh. I'm sorry, but um, it helps to start with a question, which is compared to what, right? Um, so compared to who, right? So for example, maybe about 35 to 40% of the population uh, self-describes as Democrat in the United States or liberal, right? So compared to the average American, both economists and sociologists are uh, way more to the left than the average American. And probably the reason that people think that maybe uh, economics is uh, less liberal, first of all, there is the survey data. We do know that in fact, they are less liberal uh, in the way they describe themselves. But also, here's the difference, which is that um, there are a lot of economists on both sides of the political spectrum who are very prominent. So if you so you can pick on people and say, hey, see, you know, there's my champion of the left or champion of the right. You know, um, and I always think of the great mid uh, 20th century uh, uh, debate between, I think, uh, either Milton Friedman or Gary Becker and Paul Samuelson in Newsweek. They would actually talk back to each other. Probably not Becker, it's probably Friedman. Um, but you know, it was a very public domain. Uh, the economists on the left and the economists on the right would debate issues back and forth. Uh, Milton Friedman would go on TV. He'd go on Phil Donahue. He'd be on all these t TV shows. So the public has this image like, whoa, look, there's all these uh, right wing economists and uh, economics. And it's, it's a, it may be compared to sociology. That's true. But it's not like an extreme tilt. It's actually the other way. And then in sociology, um, if you look at its history, you actually see a bit more uh, viewpoint diversity. Uh, early in the history of sociology, there were a lot of people who might be considered classical liberal or uh, champions of the free market. These would be people like uh, Herbert Spencer and William Graham Sumner. Uh, and then that kind of died out in the mid 20th century and really uh, got uh, to an extreme point in, say, the 1970s or 80s, where uh, sociology became very openly activist and to the left. And there are very few sociologists who are not left or who are not democratic in some way. Uh, and that's changing now. But uh, for a long time, it was the case that sociology def definitely had very few people who were conservative or libertarian or people who are not in that kind of progressive left spectrum. So that's the kind of uh, history that we're talking about, where it wasn't quite as extreme as it was, say, in the early 1900s, by the mid-1900s, or the late 1900s, like 1970 or 80. Sociology became very left, very activist. And that's still kind of the... the the uh, position it finds itself in today, even though I think things are changing a little bit at a time. Yeah, it it seems that it uh, this public perception can be somewhat self reinforcing. Uh, when whenever I meet someone who's you know a young person, say eighteen, deciding what to major in, I always try to sell them on economics, and I I've right. noticed that the you know I I talked to one girl who was dead set on majoring in sociology and. You know, her reason for doing that is because she felt that she really wanted to help disadvantaged groups, and she had this perception that sociology was the field to do that. And so we have this, you know, uh, concern that is associated with uh, the left and, and uh, you know, the politics of the left and activism on the left, and people who hold the, that kind of concern see sociology as the place to, to um, you know, live up to it, right? Uh, and And... Often uh, people, uh, I know a lot of young libertarians too, and a lot of them, when I talk to them, are already planning on majoring in economics, so I don't have to sell them very hard. And they, they perceive economics as a, 
has an inherently sort of libertarian field, you know, with people like Friedman you mentioned or Hayek uh, being, uh, you know, famous Nobel winning economists and uh, contributing to, to the way economics is the field is perceived. Yeah, I mean, you raise a couple of really good points, um, and uh, I, I want to address a couple of those points. One, your uh, friend, the, the young lady who's uh, dead set in majoring in sociology, good for her. I will recruit her. <laughs> that is great. But also, put it put yourself in, from her perspective. She may not want a PhD. She may not want a career in economics. She wants to spend the next year or two as an undergraduate taking a few courses that speak to what she's interested in. And certainly, I think economics is absolutely relevant to issues like poverty, racism, discrimination. There are a lot of great economists who've written on that topic. But at the same time, when you go to an econ department, the message you get is, yeah, that's interesting, but we're going to do a semester or two of calculus first. <laughs> right? Not just and, one or two. And, and, yeah, and uh, that's at the undergraduate level. Um, you know, you can get like an, a math light econ, light econ degree. So when I was an undergraduate at Berkeley, you know, all you needed was like a semester or two of calculus. That was not the honors track. It would not get you to good, good grad school, but you could do it, right? Um, but you got to understand that even at competitive colleges, most people can't do calculus, right? Unless you're at an engineering school. At most places, maybe, you know, only 10 or 20 percent of the population can do calculus. So uh, what you're what you're doing is you're self-selecting for people who are kind of like engineers in their mindset. Like, I'm good at math. I really want to fix a social problem. Economics is the math intensive tool that allowed me to do that, right? Um, and so, at, at least at the undergraduate level, sociology is actually, I think, a, actually a pretty good major for a lot of people. You know, there's the issue about how much you should be an activist in the classroom. We can set that aside for a second. But in terms of the course content, you take a number of courses in um, topics like, you know, inequality, uh, race, gender, and class, social psychology, theories of education, uh, that sort of stuff, social networks, is which I teach that. I think that's a great class. You take some great books course. It's called social theory. You take some statistics. You take a basic regression class. And that's not a bad undergraduate major for people who aren't very strong at math, which means most people, right? Mm -hmm. So I think sociology is a really great field for uh, for your friend where she's like, honestly, I'm not interested in proving how smart I am by doing calculus. I just want people to help me understand a topic. And that's where, you know, majors like econ, not econ, but poli sci, uh, sociology, education, that's kind of their niche in this market. Uh, then in terms of the graduate level, you're saying, well, you know, economics is inherently libertarian. Actually, I, even though I am a, a, a big defender of markets and individual liberty, you know, I do not uh, think economics is inherently uh, libertarian. I do not think it's inherently in any direction. And there's two pieces of evidence for that. One is that some of the great economic interventionists have been economists, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, John Maynard Keynes uh, was uh, an economist. Um, basically, almost all economists in the 1930s were hot, were big interventionists. Um, you know, so now there may be one third of economists who are conservatives or pro-free market. But back in, you know, uh, Keynes's day, it was probably like 80 or 90 percent. Right. So there's nothing in here about the field of economics that makes it any more or less libertarian. Uh, probably what their uh, your friends at the graduate level are responding to is the fact that there is a publicly identified tradition of scholarship within economics. Economics that does have a libertarian bent that you could think about, you could read about, you could critique it as well. I mean, it's a thing there to be interrogated, and um, that used to exist in sociology, but that has died out, and that's the that's the big issue. Um, so, for example, it's very unlikely you'll take. We don't call it labor markets; uh, they call it the study of labor markets in um, economics. We call it stratification. But if you're to take a course in stratification, you know, you get a lot of readings on the the evils and the bads, and you know, the ways to measure inequality. But you don't get, say, for example, whole of readings that talk about, you know, what are the positive sides of inequality? Or maybe inequality is not as bad as people make it out, to, right? So I think that's what your friends who are more advanced in their education might be responding to, which is that um, in economics, there's a clearly identified tradition. There's at least two of them. There's the Austrian tradition, obviously. Um, and then uh, there are people like Milton Friedman who are not uh, Austrians, but definitely who are very uh, strongly in favor of uh, smaller states and uh, more economic freedom. And that's two big challenges chunks of scholarship that you can engage with. While, you know, in sociology, you know, if people say, who? Who's in favor of free market and sociology? You might say, well, we got this hundred year old book by a guy named Spencer that nobody reads anymore. Right. <laughs> So that tradition is uh, has to be revived. Um, and so maybe some sociologists in the future could do that. Yeah. Or, or maybe someone with an undergraduate degree in econ could decide to pursue a PhD or, or graduate studies in sociology. There's a sociology grad student. I'm not sure if he's still in his program, but uh, Graham Peterson, 
Yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. And he um, he wrote a, an, a blog post a while back, I, I recall, saying that uh, actually sociology is a great topic for for people to study. You know, if you're if you're if you have those quantitative skills, if you've come through you know, a, a quantitative undergraduate degree and, and you, you want to, you're choosing between areas to get your PhD, then uh, I think part of his point was that if you're really strong in your quantitative skills, you can maybe get into a higher ranked sociology department than you could getting into a, uh, in an econ department. And so you need to compare what your actual options are, not just, uh, you know, the, the one-to-one you know, the fifth ranked econ department with the fifth ranked sociology department. Uh, and, you know, there, there's, there's a lot of room for, you know, when, when, when a field has, has a, you know, a gap or, or, a, you know, a viewpoint that's not represented often that, that it's also an opportunity. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And uh, I don't want to get too much into inside baseball here about the, the ins and outs of academic programs. But when I talk to people about which graduate program you should do, I ask the question, where do you want to be? Like, what is your true, what is your utility function? If I can use an economist uh, term, what is your utility function? What do you actually really, really, really absolutely care about? Um, if the answer is economic theory, then don't go to sociology. That would be a bad choice for you. That's horrible. But if you're interested in uh, social science more broadly, not just economics, then there's an interesting trade-off to be made. Also, you have to seriously consider the financial and Incentives, where um, even a, a very moderately uh, a student from a moderately ranked uh, PhD program can still make a very good income after graduation with a PhD in economics, and the job market actually is not that bad for sociology. But it's, but you don't you don't walk out of a social program making a six, six digit salary with zero publications. Uh, well, that happens routinely in economics. Um, but on the other hand, if you care about being in a competitive program, being with top notch people, being in a creative place. Then that's a trade off you can make. You can say, okay, well, I'm not guaranteed a six digit salary as I would be in a lower tier econ program. But if I can get into a top 10 social program, I'm going to have these amazing career opportunities. And maybe they won't be as financially well rewarded as being, you know, a consultant in Boston or New York, you know, the way that a lot of uh, econ PhD, that's the job a lot of econ PhDs get. But I could be in a really highly ranked uh, university with great students uh, writing what I want to write about. And a lot of the ideas overlap, right? So if you want to study, say, discrimination in labor markets. Econ is a great place to study that. So is sociology. There's some other places you can study it. If you want to study public policy, social departments teach a lot of great uh, courses on uh, institutional theory and organizational behavior. Um, and then in a few cases, you know, people teach in business schools. So you can actually get that six-digit salary if you choose a specialty in sociology that uh, has uh, demand in the uh, B-school labor market. Um, so in terms of uh, graduate programs uh, that you should think about, you have to really say, okay, if I go to the number 60 ranked PhD program in economics, uh, what outcome might I get at the end of it? Uh, and then compare it to, say, being in, say, a top 10 or top 15 program. Um, and uh, if you're in a good sociology program, you have some really uh, outstanding opportunities that you don't get from being in a third tier econ program. So that's, and there's no right answer, but you just have to ask yourself, are, are you willing to give up some income? Um, and not a small amount, actually a fairly, you're not going to be in poverty, but you will live a middle class lifestyle, but it won't be as much as say an econ PhD, are you willing to cut back a little bit on your income in order to have uh, a shot at being at a top level research one program and working with some of the best students in the discipline? And uh, each person has to decide for themselves what that trade-off is. So that's something important to think about. So uh, yeah, as, as much as I love the inside baseball stuff, uh, oh, we should uh, move on to, uh, to a conversation that even people who are not planning on going to any grad school uh, can enjoy. So um Let's talk a bit about your first book. Uh, I, I mentioned the name, Black Power to Black Studies. How did you uh, approach that topic? There's sort of a, you know, a, a historical element to it, uh, looking at the black power movement and, and how it sort of evolved. I, I think that's a, a very interesting topic. So give, give, me, give us the, uh, you know, the Cliff Notes version. <laughs> Uh, no problem. And by the way, before I forget, I want to plug my new book, which we can talk about later, Theory for the Working Sociologist, which is a short, concise uh, explanation of social theory for uh, undergrads and grad students. Interesting. So if we have some time, we should definitely mention that. But you mentioned my first book. Call, it's called From Black Power to Black Studies, How Radical Social Movement Became an Academic Discipline. And uh, I'll give you the cliff notes. The cliff notes is pretty simple, which is um, often in society, there are these organized efforts at change. We call them 
some social movements or protest movements. Uh, they're organized efforts for change that happen outside uh, the halls of power. So it happens on the street, it happens in the churches, it happens in the homes. And people organize and they come together to change something, right? And in, in the classic example of this in American history is the civil rights movement. You know, as you well know, uh, ever since, you know, the, the time of colonization, there's been a lot of racial inequality in this country. People brought slavery over to the United States and it got really rigid and really entrenched in the 19th century. Then we had the Civil War, then we had Jim Crow, and then there was a whole process there of, of trying to equalize relationships between blacks and whites. And the civil rights movement is considered one of the uh, great examples of that, of uh, organized uh, change, mainly nonviolent, um, that was designed to bring uh, political rights and economic rights to American blacks. Uh, and my book is about kind of the tail end of that story. What happens at the end of the civil rights movement is that people, they decide that nonviolence, that racial integration are limited in their usefulness and that they should pursue other kinds of goals, such as cultural autonomy, like creating institutions run by African Americans for African Americans, rather than trying to integrate into white society. And one version of this is the Black Studies movement. So I use Black Studies as an example of how a social movement outside the university comes into the university, demands change, and you can then ask, did the university respond? When did they say yes? When did they say no? And roughly speaking, what the Black Studies movement wanted was um, a set of courses or degree programs where you could come in and get a degree in African American history and culture. And those programs still exist today. There's about 200 of them. Um, you can get a bachelor's degree in it. Uh, you can also get a PhD in it. There's about 10 programs right now that offer PhD programs in uh, African American or Africana studies. And I use that as an example to study the issue of how institutions respond to social movements. So there's this big push. People are coming out on the street. They're demanding change. Um, and how does society respond? And I use education as a great way of thinking about how society responds to a social movement. And in this case, uh, what I found is, number one, society responds pretty well if you chill out. I actually use that phrase in the book. If you de-radicalize your message and your uh, policy proposals, uh, colleges and universities were much more likely to institutionalize black studies. If you, and then in terms of the nitty gritty of higher education, what you had to do was you had to shift to an interdisciplinary uh, stance, which meant that programs were built not with just black studies faculty members, but people who were jointly uh, appointed in multiple programs. Um, when you would present your research in terms of books and articles or dossiers for promotion inside the university, they often had to be pitched as an interdisciplinary approach to the black experience. And um, what failed was when uh, black studies activists would come into the university and say things like, we're going to create a black studies program to help the black community. Then what the deans and the administrators would say is, hey, that's not our job. Our job is not to help the community. Our job is to push scholarship. So that's more or less the message of the book is when you have an external social movement and they go into a mainstream institution like the university system, they have to learn how to uh, balance that how to live in that environment and how to come to um, peace with it. And if you don't, you know, you get defunded, you get shut down and you don't have much of an impact. Interesting. So so it's uh, it's kind of a, a fine line where, you know, the discipline is coming out of a social movement. It's coming out of activism and, and these things. And it would be good for for that social movement to have some representation in academia. It would help their goals. But they can't explicitly go into academia with that intention or with that stated intention and that undermines their ability to succeed. Is that more or less the thesis? Yeah, I think that's more or less it. It, it doesn't even have to be um, explicit, but at somewhere along the process, you have to understand you're no longer on the street. You're now in an office building. Mm -hmm. And a friend of mine, uh, this is Abdul al -Kalam at the University of Illinois, who is an activist and a sociologist and black science professor. He summarized my book with the following phrase. He said, it's the logic of the movement versus the logic of the bureaucracy. That bureaucracies and education is a bureaucratic system. Uh, it's an organizational system. It has its own logic. It has its own rules. And you can't take what works in activism and politics and transplant it into the bureaucracy without modification. And the people who tried doing that were the ones who tended to be less successful. Um, but the ones who at some point realized, hey, we have to kind of change our strategy, we have to change our rhetoric, we have to change our framing. Those are the ones that uh, survived in the long term. And that is the basic message of the book. Interesting. Do you know if there's uh, if some movements have succeeded while uh incorporating into existing disciplines. So black studies is its own discipline. They got their own department in many universities. 
But um, we've been talking about sociology and economics uh, and how there are different traditions within those fields. Are there, are there social movements that have sort of tried to integrate more, to your knowledge? Yeah, I think the answer is yes. There are different strategies. I think Black Studies is the example of uh, being a little bit separate um, because th and there are two sides of that. First of all, there was the um, political goal of the Black Power Movement, which was to create cultural autonomy for African-Americans. But also there was this feeling that they would be co-opted, right? So say, for example, we had a Black Studies course, you know, uh, that hits on certain topics in a specific way. Then if that's in a history department, somebody later could pick up that course and teach it differently and kind of lose the flavor of it. Or if you had had, you know, um, you know, somebody doing black politics in a history department, they could drop that and then move on to another topic. Well, if you had its own black study, a separate black studies department, they'd be able to retain that tradition much more easily. Then, as you pointed out, there are move this, and this is an interesting question, which is some disciplines themselves are movements uh, in and of themselves. So, for example, um, I think sociology could be considered kind of a movement against economics. And this is really interesting because there's there's multiple sources of sociology in the late 19th century. Uh, in the United States, actually came from journalism. There were a lot of journalists who were interested in social problems. So they became university teachers and they pushed that. A lot of them were Protestant reformers. So Albion Small in Chicago is the famous example of this. And uh, the idea is that you're this Protestant reformer. You would uh, come in and you try to set up a department of sociology to deal with social problems. Uh, but in Europe, sociology came from a critique of economics. Um, so so uh, you may have heard, I don't know if you've taken history of economic thought, but there's an earlier version of economics called institutional economics. And, um, you know, that's associated with people like Thorstein Veblen and Werner Sombart in the 19th century. Um, Veblen was a little bit later, but Sombart was in the 19th century. And uh, basically, they were revolting against the marginalists and against the people who were setting up what, what, what we now call neoclassical economics. And people thought that that approach to doing social science was incomplete or mistaken or wrong in some way. And a lot of them defected to this new thing called sociology. Uh, that was not the only way the sociology emerged, but that was one source of the river, so to say. So there are movements, there are disciplines which were movements to start with. Then in other cases, there are movements outside the university that successfully target um, uh, target institutions within the university. So on the left, for example, um, in the 1970s, uh, Marxists were very successful in getting their ideas institutionalized in English departments and history departments. Um, so for example, right before we began in our conversation, I was reading an article about Stephen Greenblatt, Greenblatt, the great uh, a literary historian who taught at Berkeley and at Harvard. And he was talking about how in the 1970s, you know, the world was open. The previous way of doing literary scholarship was toppled. They were being influenced at first by Marxism and then later by different kinds of European social theory. So and that's one way the movement gets into the university. In terms of the right, you may consider libertarianism to be a movement that was outside the university or liberalism which now has a foothold in some uh, departments of economics. So I think if you look at academia, you see the full range where some social movements set up their own disciplines, like ethnic studies. Some disciplines are social movements, like sociology. And then uh, some disciplines like economics have like like outposts or subsections of movements inside of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, places like George Mason and Texas Tech. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, it's all... Very interesting. And there's, there's, uh, academia has sort of a logic to it where, you know, you have to do things that you have to have with a certain structure, you have to publish research, and you have to, you know, te teach undergraduates and graduates, and also offer instruction. And sometimes there's sort of an un uncomfortable mix of those things. Uh, I, I read something about how English departments started out as we're just teaching people how to write. But then, you know, to fit in academia, they had to also be publishing research and analysis and, uh, you know, reinterpreting great works of Shakespeare and, and all these things. And it, uh, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily, I think the, the essay argued that it doesn't have to be that way. You know, we could just have a part of the university that is just for teaching. But, you know, there's sort of a one size fits all problem that the, the, the logic of the institution uh, dictates that we all have to uh, behave a certain way. 
You know, the reason for that, you know, just kind of follow up on that point. And, and here's another great example, not just English departments, another great example are business schools. If you looked at a business school a syllabus or curriculum uh, from, say, 1920, it was office management, you know, basic accounting, things like that. But then in the 1950s, it was felt that we needed, uh, you know, world class leadership in the business world. Right. And the Ford Foundation commissioned a very famous report where they said, look, you know, this this view that the business school is just for office management is really uh, not a good thing. And said they should be. Uh, social science units that train the leaders of tomorrow in the most advanced methods. And so you may think that business and economics go naturally together, but they don't. The economists only came into business schools in force after that cultural change within the management discipline. Um, and then you got the same problem where people said, hey, I thought our job was teaching undergraduates how to run business. And then social scientists came in and said, no, no, our job is to do advanced uh, research in economics and uh, you know organizational psychology. So it's not just English departments, lots of um, lots Lots of fields have experienced this pull, and the basic dynamic at yeah, work is prestige. That basically, uh, once people, re once the German model, the research university was brought to America in the 1880s, where then there was this higher PhD level that you could study at, and the people in those programs were doing research, then that became the prestigious thing. That kind of creates an upward pull in the largest universities, where uh, you know you're seen as low status if you don't have a master's or a PhD program, or you don't have a laboratory. Uh, people who do mainly teach and get T tend to get paid less and they tend to get less status and so that creates this upward pull all across academia to be more research intensive yeah i i, I have a lot of worries about that model uh in in economics it's it's okay because uh, well you know there's you're always going to have more students than professors in general and in mm -hmm. economics that's fine because there are a lot of uh private sector and and public sector jobs outside of academia for economists but you know in, in fields where the main job for a phd in that field is to is to teach there's sort of a a circular almost pyramid scheme kind of uh nature to it where you have 30 new slots open in the field and 100 new phd's and there's just there's not a lot you know, the, the 70 of those who don't get the slots can't really recoup their investment in, in any sort of plausible way. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. Yeah, no, it's, it's absolutely hard. And, uh, you know, uh, one thing that uh, higher education administrators have to really think about is uh, really curtailing a lot of PhD programs where they train more people that can get jobs. Because you're right, even in sociology, if, if you don't get a job in a social department, there are business schools, policy schools, you can work in marketing, you can work in consulting, you can work at a place like the U.S. Census. There's a lot of places for people with a good social science training. But if you get a PhD in history or the, the modern languages like French or English or something like that, the job market is just terribly small, right? And uh, we're solving our teaching problem with awarding degrees. And that I don't think that's a, that's the wisest uh, way to do things. We have to really think of a new way of doing that. Yeah, yeah. The, if the end game of that is that everybody has a PhD in history, you know, the entire population of Earth by the year 3000. And that's <laughs> clearly not sustainable. Um Let's, and then we starve. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, but uh, but we understand the the exact historical reasons why. Um, let, let's uh, let's talk about your new book um, it, that you mentioned earlier. Uh, it's it's a, about uh, methodology, uh, the methods or of social sociology, theory. social theory, right? Excellent. Social theory, right? What's the yeah? So that book, yes, so that book is called Theory for the Working Sociologist. Um, I wrote it because I felt that a lot of social theory was not taught very well. So, uh, so every field has a way of mystifying undergraduates, right? <laughs> um, so, for example, in an economics program, they always say before we can talk about policy, you have to know what a Lagrangian is, right? <laughs> you have to. You have to know multivariable calculus before we can teach you anything. Right. Uh, the sociology equivalent of that is to say, you have to go back to 1850 and read Karl Marx before I can teach you anything, right? And I thought, well, that's not a very constructive way to teach things, right? Uh, when you walk into a class of social theory, instead of reading uh, old books, I'm not, I'm not opposed to great books. In fact, I, I always reread the classics. Um, you know, we talked talk about Adam Smith. You know, we can talk about people like Weber. But I do believe there's value in that. I believe that value is limited for undergraduates. 
or for beginning graduate students, what they need to know is what are the main ideas of sociology? Um, how do they play out in concrete empirical cases? And in general, how do sociologists think, right? So going back to this, this book translated from German in 1910 is not the best way to do that, in my opinion. So I said, okay, what if we wrote a short book and each chapter was going to focus on one style of social theory? So for example, there's a rational choice chapter, which talks about using the language of utility functions and decision theory. And it has almost no math in it. It's all verbally explained. And we'll just talk about how those ideas are applied to the kinds of uh, uh, issues a sociologist like to think about. I have a chapter on culture and structures. I have a chapter on power and inequality to get the kind of Marx, Marxian flavor theory. And a chapter on the social psychology, uh, which I call social construction, where people come together, how they jointly, um, how do they jointly uh, create their world and how they live in it. Um, and so the idea of that book is to write a very short, compressed, very uh, concrete uh, explanation of social theory that anybody could pick up. It's aimed for undergrads and early grad students, but somebody, say economics, if they want to know what does sociology talk about, they could pick up the book and read it, um, and they could get through it in one sitting. So that's the idea. It's called Theory for the Working Sociologist, and it was just published a couple months ago with Columbia University Press. We'll have a link to that at the show notes page at economicsdetective.com slash sociology. Um, so yeah, that, that does seem, uh, like a, a necessary book, uh, a, you know, something that, uh, n needs to be written. People, people need to be able to, uh, pick up a field, right. And, you know, starting from knowing nothing about it and, uh, wow. and get up to speed and, Hopefully, it doesn't have to be a decade-long process. Right. It would be a great irony if, if in 150 years, uh, students were all forced to, to read your book and uh, you know, to, <laughs> to lear learn from the, the 2017 uh, uh, about what the field should be. My genuine desire is that I'd be uh, made obsolete in 10 years. <laughs> oh, yeah. I want a better and more a more pretty version of social theory to be written by a better person than me. But for now, this is what you got to read. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it's, um, there's sort of a, a joke in economics that, uh, you know, if you're in grad school, then you, you don't read anything that wasn't published in a, a top five journal in the last 10 years. And it's somewhat true. But it, it's interesting that um, e economics has sort of lost its connection to its history. We We don't really teach uh, history history of economic thought all that much anymore. Uh, you know, it, it used to be required and now, and then it went to an elective and then it went to an elective that is often not even available. Yeah. But, uh, right. but other fields maybe keep their connection to, to their past, but it right. could also maybe weigh them down where, where now to be a newcomer, you have to read 150 years of, uh, of arcane right. texts. Yeah. That's the wrong way to think about it. Um, if your listeners uh, listen to Russ Roberts on Econ Talk, I assume a lot of them do, mm -hmm. there's a great interview with Jim Heckman, and he actually made a great uh, argument for knowing the history of economics. Not from the old, you know, you have to read a book from 150 years ago perspective, but rather just like knowing what did what did we do that wasn't in a top journal in the last 10 years. And he uses the great example of field experiments, which are really big in economics right now, right? And he says, we tried that before. This is what we learned, but we forgot all the lessons from 1980 because we only read things in the last five or ten years mm. so if your uh, li listeners are willing to go to another uh, podcast and to listen to the Jim Heckman interview there's a snippet for about one or two minutes where he talks about this issue where he says yeah we already had a wave in economics we were obsessed with field experiments these are the lessons that were learned but now we lost them and we're rediscovering them and we didn't have to do that so I think that kind of balance where you know something about your field you're willing to read what was in the past you're not obsessed with just what the American Economic Review, or in my case, the American Sociological Review published this year, that you're actually more broadly educated in your discipline. I think that's the uh, ideal I would like to move towards. Yeah. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts? Uh, any Anything that's maybe, uh, you know, what 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 is would your message be to someone either in economics who who wants to connect with uh, with sociology, be a little more interdisciplinary in their uh, in their research or just in their general knowledge? Uh, what would you say to them? 
Yeah, so what I would say is that um, there's a lot of rhetoric around sociology. We talked about the activism before, but there's a core of very high quality research. Um, you may not always agree with it. You may not always uh, uh, appreciate uh, the political perspective that that person may have. But really, the top sociologists are really excellent scholars, and they're having a big impact. And you can learn a lot uh, from reading sociology. I'll just pick one example. Uh, recently, there's a sociologist named Matthew Desmond, Matt Desmond. He won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction this year for an ethnographic study of evictions. The book is called Evicted. And he talks about the real uh, kind of um, uh, negative cycle that evictions put poor people into, right? And uh, in an econ department, you know, they may sit around and say, well, I don't, you know, ethnography is not generalizable. It's not a controlled experiment. It's not this or not that. But I would say you're missing out on a lot of great historical and ethnographic work on human behavior that could be highly relevant. So if you really want to understand what uh, the condition of poverty is like, read the very best sociologists like Matt Desmond on uh, evictions, read people like William Julius Wilson. And this is true for any other other area that if you really, uh, you know, try to avoid the people who, um, you know, treat their scholar scholarship as activism, but instead, you know, really stick to uh, trying to prove a point to the best of their ability. Um, there's a lot of amazing scholarship on a wide range of topics um, that you can learn about. So pick up the American Journal of Sociology, pick up the American Sociological Review, you know, go to the presses like Cambridge and Chicago and California that uh, publish a lot of really good stuff on it. And uh, you'll see a lot of high quality research and people will even say that to me. They'll say, wow, when I picked up the ASR, you know, I didn't approve of every article, but there was a lot of interesting stuff in there. And, uh, you know, so avoid the um, flashy talk and the rhetoric and really just say, what if sociologists what have they said about uh, this topic or that topic? In some cases, they'll be wrong, but in other cases, they may have good points to make. And uh, I think that's the way we should treat uh, anything. You know, like if I go to, uh, you know, medical school, they may know stuff. If I go to a school of education, they may know stuff. And um, it doesn't mean I have to accept everything they say, and I should be critical and throw out stuff that doesn't look well done. But there usually is a lot of good stuff out there if you take the time to look. And on that note, uh, my guest today has been Fabio Rojas. Fabio, thanks for being part of Economics Detective Radio. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure. If you enjoyed that interview, you can head on over to economicsdetective.com slash sociology, where I'll have links to all the things we mentioned. I know there was a lot in that episode. We made references to a lot of research and books and, uh, you know, that, that episode of Econ Talk. And uh, you can find all of that at the show notes page, economicsdetective.com slash sociology. Now, if you want to do more, if you want to discuss the podcast, of course, there's a comment section always at economicsdetective.com. But I've also started a Facebook group. So this is not the Facebook page. I've always had a Facebook page for Economics Detective Radio. But now there's a Facebook group called Economics Detective that you can join and, you know, answer a few questions. I'll uh, approve your, your joining. And it's just a closed group where people who listen regularly to the show can uh, get together and discuss it. I'll post updates about the production, you know, who I'm interviewing and maybe ask ask poll people what questions they want to hear answered. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good little community right now and I'd like it to be bigger. If you want to go a step farther and support the show monetarily, you can go to patreon.com slash economics detective and support the show with a recurring donation. Some of my patrons do that already, and I appreciate every one of them. It's really nice to um, to have people support you with uh, with their money. It mean it shows me that that people are listening and that they really appreciate having new episodes of the show so special thanks to everyone who already does that and if you want to do that patreon.com slash economics detective thanks i'll be back soon 